summoning church leaders. Pope Francis takes a rare step aimed at addressing worldwide clergy abuse scandals. We have a report with Lauren Ashburn from the Vatican. Exceptionally bad news. The stern warning from a weather expert about the storm headed for the U.S. Poll positions. Ahead of the midterm elections, we analyze recently released numbers that look good for Democrats. And can you dig it? Construction workers in Italy make a valuable discovery. On EWTN News Nightly for Wednesday, September 12th, 2018. Good evening from Washington, D.C., and thank you for joining us for News from a Catholic Perspective. I'm Wyatt Goolsby. Pope Francis has taken a major step to address worldwide clergy sex abuse. In addition, the head of the U.S. Bishops' Conference is in Rome and will meet with Pope Francis tomorrow to discuss a plan of action in reporting abuse and misconduct by bishops. Lauren Ashburn is reporting from the Vatican this week and brings us the latest. Lauren? Wyatt, in a rare move, the Pope will convene the heads of bishops' conferences worldwide. This has happened only three times in five decades. And this meeting is on the theme of the protection of minors. It is set at the Vatican for February in 2019. There are 114 conferences of bishops and 21 Eastern Rite groups. This announcement was made immediately following the final meeting this morning of the Pope's Council of Nine Cardinals. And that was created in 2013 to advise him. No further details were released about this upcoming conference. Now, the question is whether bishops' accountability will be addressed. Let's look at the C9 Council. This is the Council of Cardinals. Only six of the nine were in attendance, absent. Cardinal George Pell, who has been given a leave of absence and is on trial for sexual abuse charges in Australia. He denies those charges. Cardinal Francisco Erazuriz of Chile is defending himself from charges by victims that he played a central role in covering up for an abusive priest. Now, Cardinal Laurent Pasinha of the Congo also did not attend. And one cardinal who did attend, Cardinal Oscar Rodriguez Maradiaga of Honduras. And he is under fire for having disregarded or having appeared to have disregarded evidence of homosexual misconduct by his former auxiliary bishop. So in today's off-camera press briefing, we asked whether or not the Pope would change the composition of the council by appointing different cardinals. And we were told that the list of cardinals attending the next meeting for the C9 in December will remain the same. Lauren, why wait until February to have the meeting about the protection of minors? There are those here who are criticizing the fact that it is six months away. Sources at the Vatican tell me, however, that there is a feeling among the Curia that Americans want answers within the next news cycle, and that is not possible. Plus, the Synod on Youth is going to be here at the Vatican next month, and that brings together bishops from all over the world. There have been calls to cancel that Synod and replace it with what is being called an extraordinary synod on sex abuse. That will not happen. Lauren, what can you tell us about the Archdiocese of Washington's Cardinal Donald Worrell, who is a confidant of Pope Francis? Cardinal Worrell will be heading right here to Rome again in the near future, he says, to meet with Pope Francis to discuss his resignation. He was here two weeks ago when the Pope asked him to discern his future with his brother priests. Whirl has been implicated in the Pennsylvania grand jury report released last month, and it found more than a thousand victims had been abused by more than 300 priests over the last 70 years. Now, Whirl served as Bishop of Pittsburgh from 1988 to 2006. In his letter to his brother priests, he writes, it was clear that some decision sooner rather than later on my part is an essential aspect so that this archdiocesan church we all love can move forward. He says he will meet in the very near future with the Holy Father about the resignation he presented three years ago. Canon law, remember, requires a resignation when any bishop turns 75. At the time, it was not accepted. And several months ago, Cardinal Worrell told me that the Holy Father had asked him then to stay in Washington until 2022. 
He's the chairman of the Papal Foundation, Wyatt, a member of the Congregation of Bishops. The Congregation of Bishops proposes names for future bishops. And he's a member, this is important, of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. That group oversees questions of faith, heresy, and disciplinary measures for priests. This includes those accused of sexual abuse because of World's involvement with these groups, it calls into question whether or not he could continue to serve because these congregations address the very issues for which he is being criticized. Wyatt, I spoke to an official at the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith yesterday and asked how many sexual abuse cases the office is handling. They cited the pontifical secret and they told me they could not reveal the number. However, they did tell me there are 14 officials in this congregation in the disciplinary section worldwide and that the majority of the cases that that congregation handles are sex abuse cases. Lauren, what do you know about the Pope's meeting with U.S. bishops tomorrow? Tomorrow the Pope is going to meet with four American representatives and here's who they are. The president of the Bishops' Conference, Cardinal Daniel DiNardo, Cardinal Sean O'Malley, who heads the pontifical Commission for the Protection of Minors, and Archbishop Jose Gomez of Los Angeles, Monsignor Brian Bransfield, the Secretary General of the USCCB, the Bishop's Conference. He will also be here. And the leaders of the Bishop's Conference usually meet once a year with the Pope. However, on August 16th, Cardinal DiNardo asked the Pope for a meeting. He wanted to discuss, quote, how the grave moral failings of a brother bishop could have been tolerated for so long and proven no impediment to his advancement. Now he's talking about Cardinal Theodore McCarrick, who resigned from the College of Cardinals. Meanwhile, we have confirmed that Cardinal Blaise Supich of Chicago has called a closed door meeting of his priests tonight to discuss the current crisis facing the church. All of the priests in the archdiocese are invited. It's being called an open discussion and will be held at Mundelein Seminary. Lauren, switching gears, I understand that you had the opportunity to meet the Pope today. I did after his weekly general audience. He spoke about the need to rest on Sundays, the third commandment. I did have the opportunity to greet the Pope. I told him I was praying for him, and he said, good, I need a lot. Sounds like a very special moment. Our Lauren Ashburn reporting from Rome. Thanks so much. A report on sexual abuse inside the church in Germany details more than 3,600 cases by clergy abuse between 1946 and 2014. The report, obtained by German media, says more than half of the victims were 13 or younger and that more than 1,600 clergy were involved. The German bishops' conference had no immediate comment but said it is preparing a response. The Archdiocese of Boston announces changes to the way it will process and respond to letters addressed to Cardinal Sean O'Malley on matters related to sexual abuse. O'Malley himself will now handle all correspondence on the subject of abuse instead of being filtered through his personal secretary. The process came under heavy criticism in July when it emerged that Father Boniface Ramsey had sent a letter to Cardinal O'Malley in 2015 outlining various rumors and allegations he had heard concerning Archbishop Theodore McCarrick. And 15 years earlier, Father Ramsey informed the Vatican about McCarrick's misconduct. Last month, the letter was cited by Archbishop Carlo Vigano in testimony alleging Pope Francis covered up the allegations. Joining me now is Father Ramsey, pastor of St. Joseph's Church in Yorkville, New York. Father Ramsey, welcome to the program. Thank you very much, Wyatt. Glad to be here. You tried to tell church leaders about Theodore McCarrick for 15 years. Do you feel that you're finally being heard? I, I, I certainly do. I certainly do feel like I'm finally being heard. And, and what Being taken seriously, vindicated, if you will. Sure. Well, just reflect on that a little bit for me. What impact has all of this had on your own faith, and how have you handled the frustration? Uh, I've, you know, you know, I, I just, uh, how have I handled frustration? It's been, it's been, uh, you know, it's annoying not to be taken seriously or not to know if you've been heard at all. Uh, as far as my faith is concerned, it hasn't troubled my faith in the least. And so, obviously, some of the same 
concerns that you voiced uh, have been voiced by others. What did you make of Archbishop Vigano's claims, for example, regarding a possible Vatican cover-up of McCarrick's misconduct that allegedly goes to the highest levels? Well, really, uh, I'm in no position to make that kind of judgment. Uh, I don't think we'll, we'll ever know until some of those, uh, some of the people named in his testimony speak out. Um, but uh, as I say, I'm, I'm really not in a position, and there are, certain, uh, there are certain things in his testimony, I think that's what he calls it, his testimony, uh, there are certain things, uh, you know, that uh, are not, don't seem to be borne out by, by subsequent investigation. So, I don't know, there are questions about his testimony. Tomorrow, the leaders of the U.S. bishops will meet with Pope Francis, and this isn't the first clergy sex abuse scandal, of course, the right. Pope has had to deal with. The Holy Father, of course, has got a lot of criticism for his reaction to the Chile crisis. Uh, how do you think the Pope has handled all Correct. this abuse overall? Well, I think it's taken him uh, a while to get uh, started on it, evidently. Uh, I mean, he seems to initially have dismissed some of the, uh, you know, some of the allegations as nonsensical, uh, and uh, he was a little rough on people initially. I think Cardinal O'Malley pointed that out to him, um, and now I think he's taking it seriously, but I, I also uh, think uh, that we need to hear from him quite soon about a lot of these allegations. You're a parish priest yourself. What's your advice to the faithful right now, many of whom are angry, many of whom are disillusioned? Well, I'm uh, actually going to be addressing this this coming weekend. I'm going to speak at all the masses, as other pastors have done already in other churches. Um, you know, I'm going, to, I'm going to tell them my story. I'm going to tell them that I've heard from victims. Um, and, uh, you, you know, I, I think uh, that because of what I've done uh, in my parish, they, you know, they, they trust me. Uh, that's, a, that's a start, I think, to being able to speak to them directly. Um, I, will, I, I hope that I can tell them in some way or another to distinguish between, between human beings who are sinful and fallible and fall and, and the church itself. I hope I'll be able to get that across. Well, I know all of this is a tough subject to talk about, and I know it'll be one that you continue to talk about with your parishioners. Father Boniface Ramsey, pastor of St. Joseph's Church in Yorkville, New York, thanks so much for speaking with us about it. You're very welcome, Wyatt. And stay with EWT and News Nightly for the latest in the abuse crisis. You can also read more from our partners at Catholic News Agency and the National Catholic Register. Today, Christian groups rallied outside of the White House. They're asking the Trump administration to welcome 75,000 refugees into the U.S. during the next fiscal year. White House correspondent Mark Irons reports. Good evening, Mark. Good evening, Wyatt. The Trump administration lowered the cap for admitted refugees to a historically low number, 45,000 in October of 2017. But we are only a couple of weeks away from the end of this fiscal year, and less than half that number, around 20,000, have been allowed into the U.S. Some Christians are outraged and are speaking up for refugees. They have nowhere to go because of either organized crime or violence, or there is a threat that is going to hurt them and their families. Where else can you go? And being able to um, welcome people because it is a human right for every single person to have a home and to be cared for and to be respected and for their dignity to be embraced, that's important. Laura James with the United Methodist Church says her father was welcomed, welcomed as a refugee by a church community. Catholics were also present today. Patrick Colloran, who runs the Franciscan Action Network, says Christians are called in the gospel to welcome the stranger. You know, we're called as Christians, as people of faith, we're called in the gospels to welcome the stranger, to care for the poor and the marginalized. This is what it means to live the gospels, not just preach the gospel, but live the gospel. Trump administration officials say the lowered refugee cap enhances national security and ensures refugees who are admitted are screened properly. According to the Department of Homeland Security in 2017, the U.S. granted asylum and refugee status to more individuals than Canada, Australia, and the United Kingdom combined. In the coming weeks, the administration is expected to announce the refugee cap for fiscal year 2019. Wyatt, that starts October 1st.
White House correspondent Mark Irons reporting. Thanks, Mark. Millions of people along the East Coast are bracing for the arrival this week of Hurricane Florence. The Category 3 storm is expected to pound North and South Carolina with winds of 125 miles per hour and two feet of rain. One expert calls the forecast exceptionally bad news. Businesses along the coast in North Carolina already are boarded up. One official compares Florence to a former boxing champion. This is not going to be a glancing blow. This is not going to be a tropical storm. This is not going to be, uh, you know, one of those storms that, that, that uh, hit and, and move out, out to sea. This is going to be, you know, a Mike Tyson punch to the Carolina coast. President Trump today issued a video message asking people to stay out of the way of the storm and adding, God be with you. Russia begins its largest war games since the fall of the Soviet Union. It's holding the joint exercises with China. Kremlin officials say the countries will meet often for military purposes. It reflects Beijing's shift towards a full-fledged alliance with Moscow. This week's drills feature 300,000 Russian soldiers and 36,000 tanks. The European Union will take action against Hungary, saying the country is undermining the governing body's democratic values and rule of law. Officials in Budapest are responding, saying the move is, quote, revenge for the country's tough migration policies. EU lawmakers voted in favor of the move today, which could lead to suspending Hungary's EU voting rights. There's a lot more ahead on EWTN News Nightly. Coming up, why yesterday's primary in New Hampshire leaves voters with a historic choice to make. And we have analysis on a recent midterm elections poll that favors Democrats. Welcome back. I'm Wyatt Goolsby in for Lauren Ashburn. Primary season is almost over and election day is just 54 days away. Congressional results in New Hampshire tee up a race that will make history. Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvey tells us why. Good evening, Jason. Good evening, Wyatt. New Hampshire is set to send to Congress either its first African-American or its first openly gay representative. Republican Navy vet Eddie Edwards won a six-way race in Tuesday's GOP primary. He'll face Democrat Chris Pappas, a restaurant owner in New Hampshire's first district. I hope you'll be standing with us these next eight weeks because I look forward to standing with you and the people of New Hampshire for the next two years to make progress for the people of this great state. Pappas told supporters his campaign will be about decency, unity, and progress. He supports abortion. In 2012, he reversed Republican efforts to defund Planned Parenthood in New Hampshire. Republican Edwards is a former police chief. He says he's proudly pro-life and says he wants to bring virtue back to politics. Our values have to become more important to us than anything else. And I think character matters. And I'm trying to get to as many as I can today just to say, thank the volunteers, the supporters, and the voters and, and answer those last-minute questions. Rudy Giuliani, President Trump's attorney, endorsed Edwards. Edwards is only the second African-American to be nominated to a U.S. House seat in New Hampshire. Now, tomorrow is New York's Democratic primary. Current Governor Andrew Cuomo faces actress and activist Cynthia Nixon. Cuomo, a Catholic, supports abortion at any time during pregnancy. Polls show Cuomo is far ahead of Nixon. She also supports a New York law to protect abortion at the state level. New York's primary is the last one of the season. Wyatt? Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvey keeping us up to speed. Thanks, Jason. Quinnipiac University releases a poll about the state of congressional midterm elections. It has good news for Democrats. In House races nationwide, voters back a generic Democrat over a generic Republican, 52 percent to 38 percent. It also finds voters do not want Congress to begin impeachment proceedings on President Trump by a 20-point margin. Joining me now by Skype from Los Angeles is Michael Knowles of The Daily Wire and host of The Michael Knowles Show. Michael, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. Democrats need a net gain of 23 seats to take control of the House. Turnout for Democrats was high in the special elections. How tough of a fight will it be for House Republicans this November? Well, historical trends are certainly against the Republicans. When one party holds the White House, they're very likely to lose the House in the midterm elections. However, even looking at all of these bad numbers for Republicans, polls showing that the generic congressional candidate 
uh, the generic congressional Democrat is likely to win over the Republican. You have to remember that there are no generic candidates. There are no generic House districts. This will be fought district by district. And so the particulars might change. Another question would be the Senate. It seems much more likely that the Democrats would take the House than that they would take the Senate. But we have to ask ourselves, in so much as these races in 2018 will be referenda on President Trump, which votes has President Trump lost? When people voted for him in 2016, I think there were fairly low expectations of how he would perform. We weren't sure how the economy would do, uh, how he would do on foreign affairs, how he would do on uh, government regulation. And yet on each of those areas, President Trump has succeeded tremendously. We've seen uh, tax cuts, ta historic tax reform. We've seen uh, an economy booming, record high markets, record low unemployment. And even among core Democrat constituencies, in particular the black vote, which the Democrats have relied on for decades and decades, we're seeing the Republicans and President Trump in particular performing at historic highs. So when, when you uh, get down into the particulars, it might not be as rosy a November for Democrats as they're banking on. You referenced earlier the Senate. Yesterday, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell expressed his concern for the Senate, describing races in nine states, including Tennessee and Indiana, as being dead even. Can Republicans hold on to their slim majority? I'm even worried about the race in Texas. It's possible that Ted Cruz could lose to who otherwise would be a terrible candidate in O'Rourke. Anything could happen. Yogi Berra famously said that he doesn't make predictions, especially about the future. Republicans need to go into this election knowing that all of the trends are against them and they need to turn out to vote. Okay, so we'll be following that carefully. I want to shift gears to the fallout from the clergy sex abuse scandal and ask you about that because as a Catholic, how do you think the media has been handling the coverage? The media have shown their cards. Uh, so much of this awful scandal that is plaguing the church, the devil in the Vatican, as Father Gabriele Amorth said years ago, so much of this scandal has just shed light, and light is a wonderful disinfectant. We've seen this in the media coverage as well, because for years and years, the media pretended to have such care for the victims of sexual abuse over the decades. And now that they are viewing this as a political matter, as a political fight between Archbishop Vigano and the Holy Father, a political fight that they've largely invented and about which they know very little, they have taken the side of cover-ups and of ignoring the victims. They, they continue to post in the New York Times, they'll say conservatives pounce on the Vigano letter, when of course conservatives aren't pouncing on anything. The news story is that bishops and cardinals have covered up abuse, have been complicit in abuse. All people of goodwill should want that thoroughly investigated and should want the perpetrators held to the highest standards of justice. But the media have shown their cards. They say that they're not interested in justice. All they're interested in is petty politics. Well, it's so interesting when you look at all of these headlines and actually bring to light what's actually going on. So we really appreciate your insight. Michael Knowles, host of The Michael Knowles Show. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me. There is more to come on the newscast tonight. Up next, how a Catholic priest is giving homeless people in Detroit a helping hand. And construction workers in Italy find some loose change at a building site. Why the find has archaeologists excited. Welcome back. I'm Wyatt Goolsby in for Lauren Ashburn. A Catholic priest is teaming up with the homeless to transform the city of Detroit. St. Philip Neri's chief charisms is outreach to the community by helping those in need. Father Marco Janovic and a friend are paying homeless people to clean the city's parks, overgrown alleys, and vacant lots. They also provide lunch and a reflection on a Bible reading. Father Janovic says, when I see the homeless, I see persons with a sincere desire to work. There's more information on their program at BetterWayDetroit.com. And finally tonight, construction workers in northern Italy find some very old loose change at a job site. And it's not just any currency. Turns out the gold coins are from 474 B.C. 300 of them were found in a stone jar. Italy's culture minister unveiled them at around two dozen of those coins this week. Archaeologists are, studying, are starting to study the find. And it's pretty incredible to think about how much of the ancient world is still buried under the ground just thousands of years later. And that wraps up our newscast for tonight. We thank you for watching the entire EWTN News Nightly team. I'm Wyatt Goolsby. We're back tomorrow with more news from a Catholic perspective. Good night and God bless.